Quantum volume, algorithmic qubits, qubit counts in general. What do they really tell us about the usability and power of a quantum computer? As we learn from classical computing, only running benchmark software can reveal a system's true capabilities at various tasks. Supertech is back to discuss their suite that gives us real performance data for quantum hardware. Find out more about Supermark in this episode of the Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Karagiannis. I lead quantum computing services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guests today are uh, actually my first repeat guests. They were on separately, so I thought I'd bring them on together because they're from the same company. Uh, they're the co-founders of Supertech, and uh, one of them is also CEO, and that's Pranav Gokhale, and the other is chief scientist, and that's Fred Chong. So welcome both of you back. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's great to be back. Yeah, and um, it's not just that there's nothing going on in the world of quantum, and that's not why I'm having you back on. But uh, since you've been here, uh, th your entire um, paradigm and of, of what you bring to this industry has changed a bit because uh, you hinted at it, Pranav, when you were on last time, but uh, this idea of benchmarking. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that today and uh, introduce the world to Supermark officially. Uh, and of course, there's a queue at the end because it's it's a quantum product and you're legally required to have a queue in there somewhere. <laughs> so, right. yeah. So I thought um, what gave you the idea to um, go down this path initially of having uh, Supermark? Uh, well, I, guess I we'll think start. that... Um... Yeah, I, 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 I think that the, the idea came from the fact that uh, benchmarking has been a very important and rich tradition in classical computing, uh, you know, which is uh, my background. And um, I think that quantum machines have evolved to a point where they could be uh, running a much more substantial um, uh, code, benchmarks. And we thought that we should sort of uh, leverage this tradition of, of classical benchmarking and that methodology to come up with a, a suite of quantum benchmarks um, that is, you know, sort of both balanced and principled, you know, motivated by real applications and also um, designed to work uh, both for today's machines and sort of tomorrow's larger, more reliable machines. And then finally, um, uh, sort of broken down into this thing that we'll, maybe we'll talk about today, which is these uh, features of the machine, sort of like a, a fingerprint or a DNA of each application that um, sort of tries to predict how it will run on different machines. Yeah, that's great. And, and it does remind me sort of like the old, you know, benchmarks used in like gaming systems and things like that you know you would have each each like area but in in your case you're doing things like you know finance or or whatever right and and the types of um algorithms and we'll get into all that um but going back to that initial like idea this is to correct what has been a problem in the industry this idea of like sort of just identifying what your machine is by let's say qubits which could you know vary in quality and and power um, also, you know, their ability to stay coherent, et cetera. And then this idea of artificial metrics like um, quantum volume or algorithmic qubits. And what does that really mean? Right. Um, so are you starting to see um, any companies using this and giving you feedback and saying that they want to mention the scores? Like, are, are you already seeing that kind of traction? So we just launched it last week. So maybe a little early to declare victory yet. But oh, I didn't know if so anyone was behind the scenes, you know, using it, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, You're right. Yeah. So absolutely. We have been sort of beta testing. In fact, you were one of our first listeners in that uh, P33 Chicago area quantum consortium. And we have received a lot of input, including from investors. Uh, one of the aims, and by the way, so Fred brought up this idea of super tech initiating this benchmarking effort. And it's maybe not on first glance totally obvious that a startup works on benchmarking. But as we thought about it, even this, if this is not a directly revenue generating product, we think it's a really important a service for the quantum industry broadly. Hopefully it'll direct investor and customer dollars to the right hardware platforms 
Uh, and secondarily for us, it's about thought leadership and showing customers that, hey, we can help guide you to the right quantum hardware. And that has started to take off in effect. Uh, again, it's only been a week since we've been public, but uh, in this last week, we received inbound emails from both people in the finance industry and energy industry who want to start to get their toes wet in quantum, as well as investors who have seen all this noise that's being made in quantum, uh, pun not intended, and are thinking about putting in their million dollars, of their billion dollar fund and want to know where they should get started. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I personally would like to see something like this as a like living uh, source of information that people can get because not everyone's going to run these benchmarks, but more like, hey, currently these IBM machines score like this and this is how many qubits there are. And um, do you envision having access to something like that all the time, just a constantly updated like real time source of those scores? Absolutely. And in some ways, that's the beauty of us as a company partnering with a research institution like mm -hmm. Epic, which Fred runs. I think generally in academia, you do the paper once and then it's sort of done. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've done in a bigger picture sense is two things. Number one is we've made the results of Supermark and the infrastructure for running it open source. It's on github.com slash supertechlab Supermark. And the second is a commitment to keep doing this on a recurring basis. Uh, the infrastructure is just our own base software product, Superstack, which connects to a lot of different hardware platforms. And it is going to be important that as the industry evolves, like you said, we're not just benchmarking IBM's quantum hardware from five years ago, but what they just announced today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have very concrete plans in this summer to benchmark the next set of hardware. And we see this as a ongoing story as opposed to a one, one and done. Yeah. And, and in and fact, one, one thing I would add is that, um, you know, one of the things that the SuperTech infrastructure provides is this ability to run on multiple platforms and optimize on multiple platforms. So it's a very automated way to get a very good set of benchmark results on uh, available platforms out there. And it, it it's the one thing that benchmarking, this benchmarking effort is synergistic with SuperTech's effort to provide a software infrastructure that can optimize for a broad base of platforms. And Constantinos, zooming back to your question a bit, I'm reminded of how every time the new iPhone or the new MacBook comes out, uh, A, there's a claim from Apple that this is X times better at your favorite uh, gaming or Fruit Ninja or uh, Final Cut Pro. Uh, and then to some extent, there's take Apple for its word. But then the next day, the next week, the media stories are all from Unintech, Tom's Hardware, actually running the benchmarks on the hardware and reporting to consumers, hey, does this actually work? Is your battery life actually going to be this much longer? Mm -hmm. uh, and that maybe is the level of rigor that we aspire for the quantum hardware industry to have. I know it's not going to happen overnight, but it's the vision for where we should go. Yeah, and it's going to be super useful to um, end users or companies like mine where we're helping the end users actually run these algorithms and use cases. Uh, because one of the big questions we have to decide um, the answer to is, what machine do we pick? <laughs> you know, if we're doing a binary classification problem, do we run it on INQ? Do we run it on Honeywell? You know, where do we spend the money on those shots? Um, sometimes you don't always get to run it on every single one. Obviously, that wouldn't be a very smart way to go about it. So it would be helpful to be able to look at a glance and say, well, last time we ran this algorithm, um, we got these results. But now looking at these numbers, it looks like we really should have run it on this one. And then let's try it on, you know, H1 or whatever this time. Um, that's why I like that there's going to be a breakdown by type and by algorithm. So did you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the actual nitty gritty of like which, um, which tests are being run and which algorithms? Sure. Maybe we can split this up by, I'll talk a little bit on the application side, what we're running. And then Fred can talk about how these applications are diverse and stress different pieces yeah. of the hardware. So maybe starting from the top. Uh, we did try to look at a wide range of applications. So these days in quantum, you can't have a full suite of tests unless you have things like 
QAOA, quantum approximate optimization algorithm. I know Constantinos, uh, you and I have discussed about this earlier, mm-hmm. can be used for financial applications, uh, looking how to optimize a uh, route for a shipping company or logistics company. So that's one domain. Another is in the chemistry domain, variational quantum eigensolver is for finding ground states molecules, which in turn helps scientists predict reaction rates of molecules and potentially one way to develop better drugs. Uh, so that's maybe the most application near-term centric uh, focuses. One thing that's interesting about our benchmark suite is that we also benchmarked error correction itself, which uh, for listeners is arguably the holy grail of quantum. One day we envision running things like, uh, well, the Defense Department envisions running things like prime factorization for breaking encryption or potentially Grover search at very large scale to solve uh enormous search problems. And so those kinds of applications we know are going to take much larger systems and those larger systems are going to require fault tolerance and error correction. So we thought, why not benchmark that right now? And that is what we view as the piece of our benchmark suite that is a lens into the future where there's new hardware requirements like intermediate measurements uh, and new scaling approaches. So that's sort of the spectrum. And maybe just one or two more to add in our suite. We also want to test the quantumness of the system. I think one of the early controversies in quantum has been, hey, is this device actually doing something quantum mechanical? Or is it just a classical computer that happens to be operating at a very low temperature? And so two of our tests, which are called Merman Bell and GHC, kind of quantify the quantumness of, hey, is this computer really doing something that my laptop couldn't do at a very genuine fashion? Uh, and that's, at a bird's eye view, this, the spectrum of applications that we benchmarked. And I'll maybe pass the mic to Fred. Sure. If you think about these applications, you know, the actually one of the big challenges was picking a suite of applications that both have... Uh, are motivated by something real you would do and that represent um, you know, different stresses on a real machine, right? And so I mentioned this idea of sort of a fingerprint of uh, a feature vector, which essentially is uh, a series of um, properties that a machine might have that you might be stressing in a particular program. So things that... Um, Probably may have heard of before would be you know how how good a qubit is in, in terms of its uh, its uh, its t one and t two time so basically how how long quantum state lasts um, mm-hmm. how the quality of gates right uh, one qubit and two qubit gates but then other things like um, how much communication is there in the program so essentially you know how often do different qubits have to communicate with each other how often do you have to move things around in the machine um, and then other perhaps newer things such as um, uh, how often do you have to measure the quantum state uh, and in particular um, something like these error correction uh, benchmarks have uh, something called mid-circuit measurement which is a very new thing that only uh, recently quantum machines even support, right? You're in the middle of your quantum program, you need to do a measurement. Uh, traditionally, that's only been done at the end of, 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 of your quantum application. Um, so these different um, you know, properties, we look at you know, how, how important they are, how frequent they are in these different benchmarks. And uh, we sort of show them pictorially and in, in, you can think of it as a shape, right? Uh, and that, that shape sort of uniquely identifies uh, the different benchmarks and other benchmarks that are like it. And then we try to come up with, uh, you know, benchmarks from different application classes that have very different shapes also, right? And so that's that's sort of how uh, uh, how we come up with these different stress tests. And then you can, we actually correlate the different uh, dimensions of the shape or, or this fingerprint with performance on machines. So it's like a big table in our academic paper that looks at, you know, how well does each one of these features predict the performance we saw on all these different benchmarks? On yeah, different I was just going to, I was going to ask when you end up with these models, these like gate connectivity models, do, do you then really see um, patterns in the future? Like, oh, every time we see a model that looks like this, we expect it to do really well at VQE or something like that. Does that, is that kind of like predictable now? Um, 
I think, yeah, so for certain, what we find is that certain kinds of applications are are very dependent on cert, on, on properties like the, the topology or the communication mm-hmm. capability or on the quality of measurement um, or or perhaps more standard on the quality of two qubit gates or something like that. And so if you look across the different kinds of benchmarks and the different machines, you'll see these uh, particular points of high correlation that sort of tell you, oh, this machine is good at this, and you can see that this program really cares about this. And at some level, are these shapes that you create, are they imaginary? Like, um, I know with, let's say with Transmon, it, there really is a shape. <laughs> I mean, these things really are lined up a certain way. But with something like Trapped Ion, they're sort of moved um, into position for um, computation. Is that captured? Uh, if you were to do like Honeywell or Ion Q, like, you know, that, that like when they actually move the, um, the trapped ions around. Um, right. So, I mean, let me clarify. So the shape I'm talking about is just the way that we graph how important each feature is for an application. Yeah. So then I think when you're talking about moving things around in, in, a, in, in a trapped ion machine, for example, that, that is uh, just another way to support communication. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that sort of translates into, you know, when we run a, a certain amount of communication on the machine, um, uh, what what's the fidelity of that communication, right? Yeah. And, and so you, I think that, you know, the fact that there's movement um, doesn't necessarily, you know, it's cer- it's certainly um, uh, accommodated in in the model of how all this is evaluated. Okay, I didn't know if it created an artificial shape or something that when you see it, you're like, oh, that's trapped ion because <laughs> like it I mapped see. it out. Yeah, in so, some way. Yeah. so for us, the shape is actually comes from the the program, the the benchmark, the app, the mm-hmm. software, the application, and that we haven't actually made shapes for the machines, although that is possible, right? That we we might imagine that you know is there some match between the machine and the application or something like that so far we've just taken the application and run it on the machines and then um you know sort of numerically correlated this i suppose we we might be able to plot that correlation and make another shape for the machine or something yeah because as we're in this part of the nisc era now uh, i still think we're very much going to be looking for any advantage we can get Uh you know, in one particular machine or another, sometimes one literal machine over another, even though they're the same exact technology, you know, like, um, and I was hoping that with a benchmark like this, we'd be able to see that, like, okay, for the next year, we have these machines, and we know every time we're doing, you know, a Cubo, we want to go this way, every time we're doing a, you know, like, were you hoping to accomplish that ability to be able to point to get that little last bit of the full stack, you know, benefit, that, that kind of thing? Yeah, and maybe I can reflect on a couple of nuggets of our results that start to point us in that direction. Mm -hmm. So one of them is, and maybe this is against some of the conventional wisdom that you hear from the trapped ion community is, hey, our devices have very high connectivity, therefore it's going to be good for financial applications where the interaction graph could be anything or similar for chemistry applications. And what we found actually is that for both QAOA for optimization and VQE for chemistry, there is generally speaking parity between the superconducting devices that we benchmarked and the trapped ion devices. And when we boil this down, the reason is that because of something called a swap network, and I won't get into technical details here, but it is possible to effectively emulate full connectivity with a superconducting system for these kinds of applications. So maybe the one where the trapped ion people think they would do the best, actually, there's not a definitive advantage in our results. On the other hand, and this took me a little bit by surprise too, was that in our error correction benchmarks, the two devices that are head and shoulders taller than the the rest are the trapped ion devices that we benchmarked. Uh, So that was pretty interesting. And maybe a third uh, item to add is that we saw very impressive performance from a device that had not previously been benchmarked which was uh, is the advanced quantum test bed at Berkeley Lab. Uh, so one of the other uh, thrusts of this initiative is to get more devices benchmarked, and that was one of our contributions here. And perhaps uh, they will have more exposure to uh, users through this platform. 
Oh, that's interesting you said about the um, trapped ion uh, error situation. Like the, trapped ion systems are the ones claiming they hope the fewest number of um, qubits used for error correction in the future. So that, that's like an interesting little bit of that story. I was actually going to ask you if you had surprise results. Um, are, are there any others? Like, for example, um, in the how quantum something is, that measurement, did you get anything that made you scratch your head and go like, uh, what's happening here? <laughs> you know, it's almost like a simulator is running or something. I was curious about that. So for there's two that sort of measure the quantumness. One mm -hmm. of them, Merman Bell, is really the one that indicates how much control uh, the machine has over its quantum properties. And most of the devices perform not great on it, actually. And that's not saying that they're not quantum. Uh, it just means that the, there's difficulty in maintaining exquisite quantum control. Uh, there isn't much variance. They, they all do sort of poorly. Okay. But the other one is GHC production, which just means uh, another way we describe this is how well can this quantum computer do quantum sensing? And in this application, maybe two things to note. One is that all of them do very well at intermediate qubit scales of five, six, seven qubits. And that's encouraging because a lot of people talk about how quantum sensing is maybe the nearest term application of quantum uh, technology broadly. And this kind of lines with that. We see very strong results, uh, even at intermediate scales. But the more dangerous uh, side note to that is, while we see performing uh, performance is good at small scale, medium scale, it does degrade as we go to bigger scales. And that's not to be unexpected, but it does uh, indicate the limitations in this era that we're not sure if these quantum sensors are going to scale past maybe 50, 60, 100 qubits. Uh, so those were not entirely surprising, but important results to have benchmarked rigorously. Yeah. Oh, that that is interesting. Um, did you did you give thought to applying some of these benchmarks to things we know aren't quantum? For example, you know that kind of like hybrid approach to uh, simulation that some companies are working on, you know, where you have actual individual molecules, but they're not really calling it quantum. It's just sort of like a hybrid simulation approach where they're getting two, 300 qubits. Um, do, do you think these benchmarks would be able to tell us anything interesting about those devices or? I mean, I think that those are very different machines. I mean, this mm -hmm. is definitely a benchmark suite that's initially designed for you know, these gate-based um, general machines. Um, we're definitely, I mean, one thing to say about Supermark is it's, it's, it's an initial version of a very evolving, um, you know, sort of living a suite of benchmarks. And I do envision that we would go forward, uh, with looking at more hybrid systems and, mm -hmm. um, looking at benchmarking, you know, annealers and, uh, simulators of, of, various quantumness. Um, but that's, I, I would say that's not currently in really within the scope of the suite, which already has pretty large scope, actually. Yeah, but, it does. <laughs> but, 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 but what you bring up is, is interesting. And I think that we do have some ideas for how to try to, um, to evaluate some of those other technologies and, and machine models, and even try to uh, come up with ways to compare them with the gate-based machines, which has traditionally been very difficult. Yeah, I always like to kind of think, what if, before I do an episode, you know, <laughs> like, what if this were applied this or that way? You never know. <laughs> Sometimes you strike gold on what might happen in the future. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I can just give you one example, which is, um, you know, there are these annealers, which are good at solving very approximately very large problems. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you can uh, solve essentially an annealing problem very well for a very small problem on a gate-based machine. And so essentially these two things aren't comparable because if you give the small problem to an annealer, you're basically not using most of its uh, sort of qubit capacity, right? Its device capacity. And, and it's going to solve it terribly and it's not going to look very good against the, the gate-based machine. On the other hand, if you try to take the really large problem, it won't fit on the gate miss machine, right? Yeah. And so, in fact, some other work that we've been doing at Supertech is a, a kind of sampling approach called core sets, 
which uh, basically allows you to take a large problem, essentially create a weighted sample of it, and then run it on uh, a small quantum computer, and then use that solution to seed classically a solution to the larger problem. And so that allows us actually to do sort of a, an apples to apples kind of comparison where we can take a big problem, run it on uh, you know, an annealer, a, a large sort of D-wave type machine, for example, and then take it, but then sample it down to a small gate-based machine, run it in this hybrid sort of corset model, and then try to compare those two. So that's, some, that's just an example of something that, you know, we've been thinking about in terms of future benchmarking of, of more, int- more different systems. Yeah, that's interesting. Like one goal I would have for something like this is that it becomes so popular that every machine that comes out, we hear, this is how many qubits we have, and this is our supermark score. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I know you, you guys wouldn't mind that either, um, but it would just be so much more useful than, you know, like what we've talked about in the past, um, quantum volume, algorithmic qubits, like what does that really mean? It, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just something on paper, you know, you can't prove it. Is it really erroring out? Is it? Um, one thing also in the future, um, we're going to have to reach a point where we're starting to talk logical qubits. I mean, I, we, we use the word now, but we don't, we don't really use it. You know what I mean? No one, no one talks about logical qubits. IBM announced 127 qubits. They are not logical qubits. <laughs> so they're just 127 qubits. And from what we're, we've heard, it might be 1,000 of them to get one logical qubit. We don't know. So do you anticipate evolving this to be like the logical qubit test one day? You know, like what, what are you really required to get that one error corrected qubit? Do you, do you see a path forward there to kind of like identify that? Because you're already, you're already tangoing sort of with error correction, but like, do, do you see something like that in the future, like a logical test? I mean, one, one thing I would say to say, maybe modify your question a little bit is that there's sort of a continuum between physical qubits and logical qubits, mm-hmm. you know, there's a middle ground, which would be some sort of error mitigated qubit, mm-hmm. where you take a few physical qubits and you group them together and you get a much more reliable uh, qubit that maybe you wouldn't call a logical qubit, but maybe a much better physical qubit. Um, and so that's definitely coming. And then sort of after that, I think there's definitely going to be this this uh, much higher quality, you know, logical qubit that might take, you know, minimum 20 or 30 physical qubits, but, you know, up to hundreds <laughs> of physical qubits, yeah. maybe, um, depending upon the error rate of the machine. I, I definitely see Supermark going towards that, you know, first towards error correction benchmarks as we have, but then mm-hmm. towards things like error mitigated qubits, so basically better qubit ensembles, and then towards logical qubits. Uh, it's a sort of a natural evolution as the machines start to evolve. Because it feels to me like that's the ultimate thing to prove, you know, one day. It's like, if you say you have this many logical, we want proof, <laughs> you know. It is. And maybe one concern one could have about a benchmark suite at that scale where we have logical qubits and let's say thousands of logical qubits is how do we make sure that the benchmark suite keeps up? And there's two dimensions. One is just making sure we're uh, staying up to date with whatever the latest and greatest quantum algorithms are. That part, open sourcing is where we're getting at that and evolving and adapting. But then the second part that is particularly challenging for quantum computing is how do we actually know what the right answer is once we're talking about uh, a thousand qubits. And that's actually one thing I'll point out as one of the pieces of Supermark that we put a lot of thought and attention into is that although the algorithms that we and applications that we study are things that can exhibit quantum advantage like QAOA or VQE, we were very uh, careful about the exact tests that we run such that even though in general things like QAOA and VQE are Uh, impossible to classically verify, we instantiate them with specific versions that are actually classically simulable. So although uh, at the 1,000, 2,000 qubit, logical qubit scale, uh, no one will know exactly what the output distribution of QOA should be, unless you have a perfect quantum computer, we give it a specific instance where we know what the answer should be due to recently... uh, 
discovered classical analyses of the scaling of QA on certain cases. And so that's how we get around this uh, issue that has bugged a lot of other attempts at benchmarking and scalable benchmarking. Yeah. And the one last big question I had today, um, the, the other use for benchmarking in this whole industry has been this idea of how do you prove advantage in general, right? Um, if you want to prove advantage, you're talking lab-based benchmarking uh, conditions. Like you've tried everything, you've ruled everything out, and you know for sure that quantum is better because you've ruled everything out in, in a controlled environment. Is there any way to help that along here? Is there any way to have um, some sort of like numbers that exist, maybe even just in the output scores? Like once you pass this number, you know that you've probably achieved advantage in this, you know, in this operation. Is there anything like that that's possible? Or is there just not enough data published on, on current state of the art on classical to be able to make those assumptions? I think that's certainly possible. I think that's not what Supermark was designed for at the moment, because it's designed to be runnable on current machines. Mm -hmm. I think that as the machines evolve towards uh, a more um, you know capable demonstration of quantum advantage, you know, making it more likely, I could see designing you know evolving Supermark towards uh, benchmarks that could have, you know, this sort of uh, some sort of metric of quantum advantage, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think right now it's the benchmark suite is specifically designed to be it to be scalable down to a size and sort of fidelity requirement that can be run on essentially the all of the available platforms out there. So I think that we would need those machines to progress before we refocus it towards something like quantum advantage. Yeah, it might be something you sort of backfeed into the system after, like you've reached advantage in something, and then now we say every mm -hmm. time another machine reaches the score, it probably has reached advantage as well, or something like that. Um, I was just trying to think outside of the box on benchmarking in general. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, this has been really fascinating. I, I'm super excited about this. I think I've mentioned Supermark in like five episodes. Uh, <laughs> if I'm not exaggerating, <laughs> just because I've been looking forward to something like this being in the in the actual world. So I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you guys about this again. Um, I'm going to put links to everything, including GitHub and everything in the show notes. But I didn't know if there's any last thoughts you wanted to share on this. Uh, this is your, your your final chance at a platform here to talk about this product. <laughs> Yeah, well, thanks again for having us. I think it's uh, part of this, maybe long term, it helps our business, but part of it is just a service to people who are exploring quantum. And we do hope that folks who want head to head comparisons of machines and not just abstract scores that are hard to correlate to applications, we hope that those folks will find our reports and our web portal helpful. Uh, and we want to keep benchmarking more hardware. I think so far we've done more than 12 uh, devices from over five hardware vendors. Uh, but we haven't yet benchmarked things like neutral atom devices or photonic devices. And that is very much in a roadmap. So uh, stay tuned on this evolving effort. Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, um, I think much, th thank you so much for, you know, the excitement and the exposure here, because I think that what we want from an effort like this is for it to grow and you know, be, become you know something that has critical mass and become some sort of de facto standard, such that um, you know we can get the best benchmark results that we uh, with each vendor if they give us access and um, and potentially even work together with us to to optimize for those machines, right? And so I think that the the more open the more motivated vendors are to be open to this kind of benchmarking. The, the better uh, the community will be served. Yeah, and, and just on a practical side for me personally and selfishly, like I love the idea of when I'm talking to a customer being able to say, look, you have this problem you want to solve. I know the exact machine we're going to use because we ran benchmarks and, and we know which one we want to use for this use case. So at the end of the day, that's what benchmarks are all about. So I, thanks a lot for doing this work. Sure thing. Thank you. Now it's time for Coherence, the Quantum Executive Summary, 
where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. Benchmarking has been part of classical computing for years. Supermark brings that to the world of quantum computing. Like the best classical benchmarks, Supermark runs different types of applications and algorithms to gauge performance in different areas. Supertech hopes that this will help investors decide where to focus and users decide which machines are best for which use cases. As with classical benchmarks, it should be possible to quickly test vendor claims. The benchmark uses the company's Superstack Quantum development platform as its basis. Supermark tests include QAOA for optimization problems, VQE for finding ground states of molecules, GHZ and Merman Bell to measure quantumness or entanglement between qubits and quantum control. The software also tests error correction. Results are shown visually with unique shapes and graphs that can show performance at a glance for different applications. All of this is important because when you're looking to get the best results in a use case, you'll want to choose the best machine possible for the task. Time on quantum computers can get expensive. Best to get big bang for the buck. Pardon the physics joke. Supermark is already starting to show general trends and results that we can analyze. Supermark is still focused on gate-based machines, but Supertech can see a future where the software may evaluate annealers or hybrid simulators. We've moved from quantum volume and algorithmic qubits to benchmarking, which is exciting. The next step would be identifying how well machines do at creating error-mitigated logical qubits. One day, we might also be able to have scores that reflect if machines are in a performance range known for quantum advantage. There are a lot of possibilities for the future here. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Pranav Gokhale and Fred Chong for joining to discuss Supermark. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to Pertivity's The Post-Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Pertivity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Pertivity.com or follow Pertivity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. Quantum Curious